Hi, I'm Dee Ramirez. We're up in Sheffield in my Sheffield attic studio. I'm going to give you a tour of all my kit and uh, along the way demonstrate a few pieces of my favourite gear. Okay, I'm going to start you off with the, the keyboard rack, which is actually to the left of my studio. Um, you can see at the top there we have the Juno 106, which um, is something I've it seems like I've always had a Juno in some incarnation. Um, this isn't the original one I bought. The original one uh, we used on a Radio 1 road show when I was in a band called the Lisa Marie Experience. And consequently, as we were on stage, it started to rain. And I was using mine for miming, of course. <laughs> um, but then, of course, when I got it back home, it was uh, no longer working. But I still managed to sell it for quite a few quid because people are like crazy about Juno, as always have been. Funny thing about the Juno is, is that uh, they're terribly uh, unreliable. They're constantly, the oscillators keep going all the time. Um, they're always going out of tune. The pots are like, oh, it's, they're really bad. So it's constantly in the shop getting repaired. But uh, even so, it's still worth it because it's just got that classic, classic uh, roll and sound. And I think uh, what's so good about it, it's not so much the synth architecture, because it's very simple. It's you know, one DCO, a sub oscillator. Um, it's it's kind of like the way that the filter sounds. My, my favorite thing about the Juno is the chorus, because it's just got that really old school, very wide roll and chorus about it, which is gives it that real big fatness. It's terribly noisy though. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, the sort of range of sounds you can coax from it, uh, it's incredible really, considering it's such a simple synth. And the reason why I've had, had one for so long is because it's what I learnt, well, one of the synths that I learnt synthesis on, because it's very much the classic subtractive, you know, starts with the DCO, goes into the filter, then goes into the single envelope, and that's the sort of synth architecture it is, and it's very easy to get your head around, and, you know, but also makes nice sounds as well. So that's the Juno. I think this one I've had since 1994 when I, no, 95, when I had to get rid of my rain soaked one. <laughs> so I've had this for quite a while. Um, and I use it all the time. It's one of those synths. It's just, I, I try not to use it. I'm like, oh, I don't really want to use the Juno, but, <laughs> but it's just one of those things that sounds great in every mix. There's a reason why they're so classic, I think, for sure. Then we come down here, we've got the Prophet 8. Um, I bought this from Funk Agenda, and he <laughs> he was very down on the thing. He was like, I don't like this synth. He's like, maybe you want to have a look at it and see what you think. He goes, it's like, it's weird. It's kind of, you, play, you, play, you play something and it uses all the voices and all the pops are weird. And it's like, it's not particularly, doesn't really sound great. And I'm like, well, let me have a look at it. And of course, the first thing I noticed was it was the original uh, one that he made, which had got the dodgy pots. And the problem with, with the pots was, is that they were endless rotary encoders. And for some reason, they weren't very responsive. Something would happen with them where they would, you'd try and turn them and um, it, they wouldn't, wouldn't respond. And, uh, especially the ones like the filter cutoff, which had obviously had the most use. It was just very, <laughs> it didn't actually work. So you'd, you know, you'd turn it to jump from one to 127 in one go which kind of like rendered it useless. But then Dave Smith or DSI Instruments in their infinite wisdom decided to release uh, uh, the, the actual encoders, a new set of encoders for it, which were quite cheap. Um, didn't only cost like a hundred quid or something, maybe not even that. And uh, I just took it to my synth guy and he, he installed these new pots and it came back with the, uh, the stop encoders. I think that's what they're called. Um, not the endless ones, which are, which actually made the synth usable <laughs> for a start. And it is actually, now I can use it, it's quite a beautiful piece of kit. And I'm sure you guys have like seen quite a few of these before, but uh, it is, it's just one of those things that's just got a fatness about it that you can't replicate with anything else. It's, um, of course, you know, plugins do a great job of replicating things, but there's some bit about this one that makes it just sound a little bit different and that bit fatter. I, I, I've always found this very Oberheim-like in its sound, this one. Um, Again, nothing else like it, and that's why it remains in the studio. So, down here you can see this old beast. <laughs> now this, as I had a battering, it used to go on the road live. Well, when I say live, I used to do 
<laughs> live PAs. <laughs> Actually, this is a funny story. This is the synth, and uh, I was playing in Nottingham once, years and years and years ago, and um, I was actually, it's terrible, I had a backing track on, so I was kind of like miming on stage, and this is a synth I was using, and I was plonking away on the synth, and uh, the keyboard stand broke, and it fell off into the, into the audience. <laughs> of course, the music's still carrying on in the background, and I'm synthless. <laughs> So this is it. That's why it's kind of battered. But I kept it because I knew one day it, 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 it was so big when it was released in sort of 1986, I think it was. And, uh, you know, it, it featured on so many different records in, the in its time. It was sort of like that and the DX7, the D50 and the DX7 kind of defined an era of music, I think, in the 80s. And uh, it was so... You know, you knew the sound so well. Each preset had been used to death. Um, and you can hear them on endless, endless 80s records that it became so out of fashion because it had been caned to absolute death that uh, I knew that one day it would come back in. So I, I've kind of kept this synth battered as it is and whatever until this day, which is like, I've got it out again now. And it's, I even went as far as buying this uh, PG-1000 programmer here, which... The guy on eBay told me that uh, it, it worked quite, everything worked fine. And when I got it, <laughs> of course it doesn't work, <laughs> but I'm gonna get it to work, I'll tell you. So that's, that's off to the repair shop soon. Um, but there's just something about it. It's uh, the, the, the architecture of the D50, I don't know if anybody's aware, but I'll tell you anyway, it's basically, it's got two analog oscillators and two digital oscillators. The analog oscillators are uh, quite simple um, DCOs, um, um, with, and it's got the analog filter, uh, but then there's two other oscillators which are actually PCM based, actual sample based. So, and in the day when it was released, sample memory was so low that it's probably like about what a 0.5 of a second of sample memory that comprises all of these all of these samples, tiny samples, to make these other two oscillators. So you've got, and then you can mix them. You can see this vector vector thing here. You can actually mix the four oscillators together. Uh, you can even, I think you can even record this, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, it's two, two analog, two PCM oscillators. And it kind of creates this very interesting. So you can hear there that that's the pluck. The, the, the attack of that is the, the pluck of a uh, acoustic guitar. But then the, you can hear that the, the tail of it is possibly an analog. You can hear there the background, there's the analog side of it and it's very clever how it combines the two so see i've heard that sound so many times yeah <laughs> but really nice so 80s it's unbelievable but there's a whole like uh, music scene that's coming out now that's sort of using these kind of sounds i'm hearing like the m1 a lot on stuff especially like all those sort of new garage kind of sound, uh, things that are around, all these things that seem to do really well. And this, so uh, it's gonna be getting a lot of use, I think. So yeah, I'll demonstra demonstrate some of this head joystick action that uh, I was discussing. So there's the sound, that's like the, all the sound, all the oscillators mixed together. And then each individual oscillator. You can hear that's probably a sample, PCM. There's a, one of the analog ones. There's another one of the analog ones. And that's the, the samples. And that's how you mix them all together. So there's the, the sample again. There's the analog oscillator. Quite nice, really, I think. Notoriously difficult to program was the D50 uh, because this sort of came out, they, they, it came out around uh, just after the uh, the Junos range and Roland thought, well, they tried to cut costs and what they did was take all the sliders off things and they had the, the whole, the whole, the old data entry and kind of, you know, entering things in with one, <laughs> with one scroll wheel, which was just horrendous to, to program. So. Obviously they realized that and that's why they brought out things like the, these programmers. 
And of course now, uh, synth manufacturers are going back to things like this. Pro uh, you know, Dave Smith's making actual synths with actual knobs and, and faders. So, so yeah, that was a big mistake, I think, from all the, uh, the synth manufacturing companies making these synths uh, that didn't have the, you know, a control for each function, basically. So and I think they've realized that cutting costs, they ended up shooting themselves in the foot, I think. Okay, so we're over to the rack section of the left-hand side of the studio, and uh, we'll start from the top. We'll start with this beautiful yellow-looking thing here. This is a Waldorf Micro Q, and uh, it was the smaller brother or sister of the, uh, the Q, the Waldorf Q. The Q, um, a friend of mine, Tom Stefan, who was Super Chumbo, he had a Q, and he brought it to the studio, and I just thought it was amazing. Um, but the Q was a lot easier to, to edit because it had a knob slider per function. Uh, whereas this is, they've done away with it, hence why it's its smaller brother, but it's the, the synth architecture is the same. Uh, it's virtual analog, as in it's a, you know, it's not a real analog synth, and it has four parts, so, and it's something like 32 voice poly polyphonic, it makes drum sounds, it's the whole, an all singing, all dancing beast. So, um, yeah, and this was in the day, uh, the days when virtual analog became popular, and we'll get down to the Nord in a minute, but Nord were sort of the pioneers of virtual analog um, back in the 90s. And um, yeah, so Waldorf followed suite and uh, did their, the virtual analog thing. I do believe it's virtual analog. I'm known to be wrong sometimes and people do pick up on this. So uh, uh, I should have really done some research first, but I think it is. And, uh, and the, the most beautiful thing about this is the, is the fact it's yellow and I just think it's cute. So it stays there for now until I can find a power supply and get it plugged in. And we go down next to the uh, the Voyager. I actually bought this. I rushed out to the shop. I pre-ordered it before it was uh, available because I just thought, wow, you know, chance to buy a, a sort of mini Moog Mark II type thing. And so I've had this for a number of years and I got it in about 2006, 2007, I think, um, when I think it was, yeah, one of the first production straight off the production line. and. Yeah, uh, it's, I've had it ever since. And it, it was, I have to admit, when I first got it, I, I thought it was gonna be a Moog Mark II. I think that's how they marketed it and that's what people expected from it. But to be absolutely honest with you, it doesn't really sound like a mini Moog, um, or mini Moog, as the Americans say. <laughs> it doesn't really sound like one. I, I find that the Voyager's a lot tamer than a, than a mini Moog. Um, there's just, it's very fat and it's very warm and it's great for bass and, um, but it just hasn't got that kind of aggressive, aggressive feel about it that the Mini Moog's got. You can get some really nasty sounds out of a Mini Moog just because of the few modulation options in it. This seems a lot tamer. So consequently, it just sort of sits in the rack there and I use it for bass sounds. It's great, um, the current crop of kind of, you know, warm analog sounding bass tracks that have been around new disco stuff and it's great for that. But in terms of you know getting any anything more aggressive, it's not the synth that I reach for. So, but it does it does light up blue, which I really like. Look at that, that's pretty, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, next thing down here, this is I'm I'm quite bitter about this uh, SSL. I bought this I bought this a few years ago, maybe maybe ten years ago. I don't know how long ago, but quite a long time ago. And uh, they SSL in their infinite wisdom have stopped supporting it. Um, it's, it's basically like the power core or it's like the UAD. It's, a, it's an offline processing box. Uh, the processing for the plugins is done in this box. Um, and, it's, and it runs the beautiful SSL uh, bus compressor, the EQs, the, vo the vocal um, plugin, um, the drum strip, all the beautiful SSL plugins that you find in their digital consoles. It runs those from this. Um, but SSL have stopped supporting it and now Logic is now 64-bit only. This, they haven't, um, they haven't changed the plugins to 64-bit, so consequently, I can't actually use it. So, but Radix have made the 32-bit lives, uh, which is amazing, so hopefully I'm gonna try and get, get it working with that, because uh, it it's great for me, because I'm still using a 2008 Mac, which in computer terms, it's a bit of a dinosaur, but I'm still using that, so I could do with all the processing power I could get, really. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna try and get this running at some point. Next in the rack, this is not the first Nord I bought, because I sold the first Nord I bought, stupidly. Um, 
uh, this is the, the Rack 2. I, I loved it so much after I sold it and I missed it so much, sorry, that I went and bought the Rack, the, the second version of it. The first Nord I got, I think, and oh, tell me if I'm wrong, I'm sure somebody, somebody's gonna correct me. Uh, the first Nord was the first virtual analog synthesizer. They were pioneers of it. And when it came out, it was something like a thousand, twelve hundred quid. It was a four voice, um, a four voice analog, virtual analog synthesizer. Virtual meaning it wasn't actually analog. It just replicated the sound via, you know, uh, via you know a digital way, digital format. But it was just amazing. The first Nord was great. It's got like four outputs. Um, you could play four different sounds from it. It's four part multi timbral. Um, it was a real revelation, and the sounds you could get out of it was, were just great. Nord are just my favorite, one of my favorite companies. They're, they're, they're brilliant. I, I generally can't tell the difference between analog and virtual analog when it comes from a Nord. They are that good. Uh, the Rack 2, I think, increased. Oh, that's right. I remember the first Nord, you could buy uh, a little plug-in or some kind of modification for it which increased its polyphony from four four voices to eight voices and that cost something like 300 quid of course i i did that um so this synth was like you know probably a best best part of 1500 1600 quid <laughs> i probably sold it for 200 pound like like normal so yeah that just sits there that's that's basically again not not actually plugged in because i use the nord 3 which we'll come to in a little in a little while Underneath that, we've got uh, the Roland JP8080. Um, this was, uh, I, I actually bought the keyboard version first, which I've got downstairs. And um, somebody said to me, do you want to swap your Novation Supernova for a Roland JP80? And I was like, oh, okay, let's, let's try it out. And uh, I actually fell in love with it because it's, it's an interesting synth. Uh, again, it's virtual analog. It's not a proper analog synth. Um, it was Roland's attempt uh, following suit with uh, following suit, sorry, with um, with Nord and making the virtual analog instead of real analog. Of course, now all synth manufacturers are realizing that people want real analog. <laughs> virtual analog is a dirty word. People don't want plugins. They don't want uh, replications. They want the real thing. But this is the the virtual one. So, um, but it was interesting because. You can see it's quite. It's very easy to program. It's you know one knob per, per function, and it had got some interesting um, features. The uh, it it sounds or it's supposed to sound a little bit like a JP8, you know the Jupiter 8. Sorry, um, similar in its two oscillators. Uh, it's got cross modulation. It's got two fil uh, two envelopes, one for filter, one for um, volume. Um, it's got two LFOs. Um, yeah, various modulation routing. So it's, it was supposed to be, you know, the new version of the Jupiter 8. <laughs> it doesn't sound anything like a Jupiter 8, of course, but it is an interesting sounding synth in, it, in itself. Um, and it was like, it was, you could have it as a uh, two sounds stacked on each other, a split stack, or you could have it as a, you know, just a single sounds. And the sounds are quite nice. You know, he's got the old aftertouch there. Not the fattest thing, but it had got um, interesting things like it had the, an EQ uh, built into it, so you could, you know, uh, do some basic EQing with it. It's also got uh, this, the rack versions also got a vocoder. Sorry, I haven't got a mic to show you that, but um, yeah, you could, you could do some basic vocodering with it as well. And it could also increase the memory <laughs> from something like 500 to 1,000, um, yeah, uh, presets. But it's it's really nice. Yeah, it's good at sort of replicating that that classic Roland sound. Yeah, that sounds a bit like Depeche Mode to me, the old early Speak and Spell album. Plus you got the the cross modulation, which is something that's quite interesting. And then things like um, an envelope for pitch, which was quite nice. Ooh. 
So the range of sounds out of it are actually like yeah, quite extreme, really. And I used it extensively in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. Um, not something I use so much these days. I don't know why. Um, I think <laughs> I think doing this now is making me realize I've got some really interesting pieces of kit. So I'm going to get them out again and start, uh, start playing with them. What I have got for these things is I actually invested in some analog preamps. Um, so uh, I de generally send these synths, especially the digital ones, through, um, which we'll talk about in a bit, through some of the, pre the analog preamps just to sort of give it a bit more of a warmth to it. Because I found that some of these, especially this one, was a little cold sounding. It didn't quite nail the analog sound quite well, but if you stick it through a nice preamp, it works, it works really well. You see what I mean? It's quite sort of nasty digital sounding. Which, to be fair, was its was in its favour, and that's why I liked it. It does cut through a mix quite well. So yeah, I think you can pick these for pick these up for about four hundred quid now, which uh, I would highly recommend because they are they are great, and it's the beautiful thing about these. Uh, racks is it's just the, the editing of them, you know, the tactile ability of being able to just actually reach for something and turn it, you know, rather than using a mouse. I always think using a mouse is a bit like making music with a tweezer, you know, so just for the fact that you've got, you know, a knob or a slider per function and you can edit the sound really quickly is, is, is I think, the reason why that all these analog synths and you know, the actual hardware is, is coming back in fashion now because people want, you know, to be able to control it rather than using a mouse. Using a mouse is so soulless, isn't it? It's like, so highly recommended. We're over to this side of the studio now, which is where the, uh, the mothership is. And uh, we'll start with the monitors. Over in the, uh, the, the left corner there, we've got the event Opals. And now I, I bought these purely because of the Future Music <laughs> review, <laughs> which they did like this massive, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a massive like 10 page spread of like all these, you know, reviewing all these different monitors. And they said uh, Future Music quoted them as being the, the best monitors they've, they've ever heard at that price. So just purely off the strength of that review, <laughs> I went and bought them. And you know what? I wasn't disappointed because they're amazing. They're like something else. The bass that just comes out of those things is incredible. And uh, you know, it's almost like there's a sub attached to them. It's, they are that good. And what I really like about them is, is that they are not only very loud and very clubby, but they're not so directional. Um, I don't know if it's something about this whole um, you know, the, the wave thing there, the wave thing's quite wide, so you don't get a very specific sweet spot, which is nice. Um, unlike the Genelics, because they're, they're, they've got a very specific spot. If you move slightly up or slightly down, you're out of that spot, which is, you know, can be quite annoying. So it's good to have a set that aren't so, you know, specific for that spot. Um, they weigh an absolute ton, because we're in the attic here and getting them up the attic, 25 kilos each. <laughs> it was, was kind of, it was quite, quite hard work in this massive box. But they are really great. I've, I've been really chuffed with them. So thank you, Future Music, for such a great review. And uh, yeah, um, one thing I didn't get for them is you can get a mic, uh, a calibration system, which um, because they were quite early in the uh, production run, so I've not managed to get that yet because it would be nice to get them calibrated for this room. So so we go to the Genelics here. I've used Genelic speakers for forever. And I started with a 1029, the, the original black ones. Uh, I had a little sub and the small uh, black 1029s. And I really loved them. And I've always, always loved the sound of Genelic. There's just something about them. And I think some people hate the sound. Some people love the sound. They're a bit Marmite sometimes. Um, but I just, I just really like them. And, um, a friend of mine was using the 8030s, these are the 8040s, and uh, the 8030s, I, they're always, you look at them and think, oh, that's a small look, look, little speaker, but then you just get the most incredible like volume out of the darn things. So he had the 8030s, and uh, I saw these for sale, so I bartered with the guy and managed to get them for like 700 quid or something, which I thought was quite reasonable for, for the 8040s, and they are amazing. And funnily enough, Although there isn't as much power out of them and there's not as much, you know, the, uh, the sound's not as big, they are quite nice for just using all day. Um, um, they're not so 
fatiguing on the ear. I think that the events, like you tend to want to crank them up a bit when you're using them. So it, it can be a bit like, oh, too much volume after a while. Whereas the genetics, you can work quite quiet on those things. Um, so they're great for mixing. A lot of mix engineers swear by the Genelics. They use the 8050s, I think, most of the big boys. Um, but the, um, the, the 50s were a bit too big. I've only got a specific space on the end. You can see that I'm using the prime acoustic uh, recoil stabilizers, they're called. And that's just to basically try as, as much as I can to decouple it from this, uh, this, this rack here. This rack obviously isn't the best place to position your speakers because when you, you know, the sound coming out of there will vibrate this rack, especially this like metal CD holder thing here. So that is my attempt at trying to get like, uh, decouple those speakers as much as possible. It's not recommended to put your speakers like that, I've got to say, um, but that's why these things exist. So uh, they say, if you get an acoustician in, which I've had in here many times, he always says, don't do that, he freaks out. <laughs> he says, buy some stands. Talking of stands, these are amazing. Um, the Tower Sonic stands, really good. They were a fortune and they're so heavy because they're full of lead shot. Um, but you can adjust the height and everything and sort of there, you know, they're on very um, big spikes. Same as the speakers, you can see I'm using China cones for the speakers there. It's, it's all an attempt to try and decouple the speaker from the, uh, from the stand as much as possible. So I'm not gonna resonate anything through the room, <sighs> an attempt. Um, so yeah, so that's the monitors. You can see I've got these little JBL things here. That's just uh, my attempt at getting the, sh the crappiest pair of speakers I could get so I could just hear what it sounds like on a crap system, which is like, you know, a lot of people listen to music on crap systems. Funny thing is you make an amazing track, um, you get it all like sonically perfect, and then people listen to it on computer speakers, you know? So it's like, <laughs> what's the point? So anyway, that's just so I can hear what it sounds like on there. Now, this here is an interesting piece of kit. It slides out. I think it's the KRK Ergo. Um, I've got a problem in this room. I think it's something must be something to do with it being an attic, and it's you know that kind of that kind of shape and the positioning I'm in because I want to fire over the long uh, length of the room that way. I think I, there's a lot of bass trapping going on in the room, so consequently the sound's not very true from the monitors. Um, when this came out. I like the idea of it. it what, what it does, it comes with a little microphone and it, um, you plug it in and you, it fires out sign uh, noise actually from the speakers and it determines if your room is whatever, whatever the problem with the room is. Um, it turns out that my room is actually really bass light so it's sucking out all the bass in this room. I think, it's, I think the, the bass goes underneath the eaves whatever of the house. And what this does is attempts to compensate for that. Um, um, and what it does is you've got three settings. You've got uh, a focal setting, which is um, it takes a measurement of where you sat in the focal position, i.e. the sweet spot here. It takes a measurement of that and adjusts the speaker accordingly to the room. And then it takes a, uh, a then there's a global setting, which you put the microphone in all the different parts of the room and it uh, takes a measurement for that. So if people are sat at the back there, it uh, you know, compensates for the, the, the room, um, what it's doing to the speaker sound there. Um, but it's quite kind of freaky because obviously I've got such a problem in here that when I put it on, the bass is just so increased, like um, up through the speakers, it's obviously I'm, I'm hearing so little bass that it, it really does pump it up. So it's, I'm not sure if it's something that I can trust a lot. I, I think I need to do a bit more investigation into the room, I think. But anyway, it's a great thing. It's a great tool, um, not particularly expensive. I think it was about 500 quid or something back in the, when I bought it. But it's been very handy to have that reference to be able to either leave them normal or switch them into two different modes just to see what the room's actually doing to the speakers. So it's a great reference. The next thing on here is the, is the Nord Lead 3, I spoke a little bit about the Nord 2 over there and the reason why I don't plug that in anymore is because I'm, uh, you know, I love the Nord 3. Something that I've had since Future Music visited me in 2006, <laughs> which is nearly 10 years ago, can you believe it? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, th this synth, if anybody doesn't know, uh, was actually responsible for a remix that I did of a band called Body Rocks um, and the track was Yeah Yeah, 
which, which did quite well. And actually, consequently, synth, uh, Future Music um, awarded me best synth sound. Hey! <laughs> and this is the said synth that did it. And here's the said sound. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember the riff. So yeah, there's, there's the synth. Um, there's just something about the Nord 3. It's just, there are a few features on it um, that makes it stand out from everything else that I've got. Uh, not only is it one knob per function, um, it's only two oscillators, but what it's got, it's got all of these distortion um, possibilities. You've got uh, the filter, you can distort the filter pre-envelope and then you've even got a filter there, which is actually a distortion, distortion filter. Um, and what it tends to do, it adds these very rich third harmonics into it, almost like there's a third oscillator. So that's the sound without the distortion to the filter. And you can hear that extra harmonic coming in there which almost sounds like a third oscillator and it's sort of detuned to the, you know, it's an extra harmonic there. So that's why I remember uh, various people trying to replicate the sound. And um, so I, I read the whole thread and they were like, right, so you need a three oscillator synth. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, no, you don't, because this is only two oscillator, but it's just the way that the architecture works in, in terms of this distortion for the filter here, which just adds that extra harmonic in, depending on the, uh, on the detuning of the, the sound. Um, it's also, uh, it's, it's got very good FM um, uh, stuff going on as well. So it's, it's, you can add, you know, you can have one of the oscillators, an FM oscillator, and you can have another one as a normal uh, analog, virtual analog oscillator. So the breadth of sounds out of the things is, is actually really good. Um, and the Body Rocks sound in particular was just one of those I was just messing around. I, got, I just got the synth and I was messing around with it and it was a total accident that I came across this sound. And I, I literally think you could play any riff with it and it'd sound great, you know, it's just, it's, it's literally the sound that made that track. So, but there are other. A, there's a great stack detune function here, which you can add more or less into it. Which is really nice. Again, with the distortion as well. It's quite a fierce, it can be quite a fierce sounding synthesizer. Um, you know, it can be gentle, it can be analog. You know, and then, then you've got the classic FM sort of sounds out of it as well. So it's actually a really versatile synthesizer and this is why it sits here with pride of place in my studio, has done for the last 10 years or whatever, eight years. And uh, yeah, I still use it extensively to this day. So thanks Nord. <laughs> um, so moving down here, we come to the Focusrite liquid channel, which um, this has got like 47 preamps and 47 compressors, um, all sampled using convolution technology. and. Um, but not only that, it's actually got a very nice, just a standard preamp that doesn't use any of that. So if you don't want to, you know, colour the sound with a with a sort of sample pre preamp or a sample compressor, you can just use the normal um, clean um, preamp that it it's sort of comes with. So not only does it sound beautiful, if you do want to add those extra sounds into it, you can do as well. So it's great, and you can store all the settings. You've got the EQ there. And so it's really good if you want to sort of, if you work with a vocalist um, regularly, then you can find out what suits her voice or his voice and then store it as a snapshot. So as soon as they come here, you've got the combination of the 1176, um, you know, compressor and, the, and, a, and, a, and a preamp of your choice, basically, whichever suits the, the voice best. And um, so, yeah, I've got like three or four different vocalists that I work with that that come in here and uh so i've you know i've just got a, a, a setting f for them um yeah so that's really nice um what i found with that is that i don't really use the emulations the preamps now i just use it as a as, as it's straight straight in and it's just really nice sounding thing underneath that this was uh i bought this because ua were doing a deal and basically you got if you bought this, you got a free UAD uh, satellite satellite duo thrown in, which was great for me because I've, I've got two studios. This is my main one, 
but I've also got one in London. Um, so it means that I can, uh, you know, run the, my UAD systems off a laptop as well, because um, my UAD system is based is on a PCI card in the in the Mac at the moment. So, but as a bonus, uh, <laughs> it came with this. So that was a great offer from UA. I think I think they did did, did really well with that because this is. It's just beautiful. It's a classic, you know, the 610 preamp is, is, is amazing. And then it's coupled with, I think this is like a, a single channel, well, it's, an, it's supposed to be the LA-2A um, uh, compressor there. So it's really nice, not only just for putting vocals through, but I use it for synths. So um, especially like I was talking before, a lot of the virtual analog synths, um, the Nord, um, the Roland JP80 there can sound a bit cold. So if you stick it through that, it just gives it a bit of like that kind of warmth that you might be looking for. Um, so you can either you, you can either drive the preamp as well and give it a bit of distortion, um, or you can just use it for the compressor. Either way, it's 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 a beautiful piece of kit, and I think that's something that, that's like it's going to remain there forever because it's it's it'll always be a classic. So that's what I try, try and do now. I don't just buy any old stuff. I buy stuff that I'm going to use and that I can keep using and that might might even keep its value. <laughs> Who knows? So next along down here is the uh, Thermionic Culture, it's the Culture Vulture. Um, this I saw in Steve Mac's studio, he got one of these and it's just one of those things that sounds, it's a distortion unit, it comes with this particular model, comes with three different types of distortion, Pento 1, Pento 2 um, and Triode. Triode is even harmonics, Pento is uneven harmonics or maybe the other way around, I don't know. And then there's this fancy pentode one at the end there, Pento 2, which is some kind of harmonics I can't get my head around. <laughs> but they all do colour the sound in a different way. And it's basically a very posh distortion box, um, which you can either drive really hard. You've got the overdrive knob there. You can drive it really hard, or you can just do it very subtly. And it's, it's just a beautiful sounding, it's all valve based. I think you've got like one, two, three, uh, four, four, you know, about five valve stages uh, on each channel it's stereo and uh, so yeah you can you can drive it really hard or you can have it very subtle it's just a nice warming thing wasn't cheap <laughs> I've got to say and to spend like I don't know best part of 1200 quid on a, on a distortion unit it, some might say it could be crazy but <laughs> But it's just got something special about it, as is all of the, the, the thermionic stuff. It's just beautifully made and beautifully sounding. Uh, underneath that is the Motu. Um, this is basically something I've used for years. It's just uh, a sound card, but it's got 24 in and 24 outs, all balanced, which is great for like everything's just hooked up permanently to that. And then underneath that, we've got the Apogee Ensemble. Um, a special mention about that is because that was made specifically for the Apple, um, the Apple Mac. So in terms of like the sound of it, it actually, it's got that very nice Apogee quality to it. It's not the most expensive Apogee, Apogee box you can get, you know, some of them are an absolute fortune. This is sort of a mid price at a mid range, but it's, I did a shootout between that and a few, loads of different um, um, sound cards that I had in the studio, and I really like the sound of that because it's just got something, a bit of a nice sheen about it. Um, so yeah, I've stuck with that one. Okay, so we're over to the right-hand side now of the mothership. <laughs> uh, let's start with this. We've got the TL Audio Valve preamp. This was um, a, another uh, sort of purchase that I made because I knew that it'd be something that I could keep for quite a while, and uh, it would be really handy because, again, because of the synths, type of synths that I've got it's uh, another way of kind of warming up the input and also as well it's got the high Z input um, so we can you know we can DI things like guitars and basses you can see my bass guitar there um, so it's great for that so I generally use it for synthesizers because it's stereo uh, unlike the uh, the UA uh, 610 there Mark II which is mono so this is great for things like the Nord to stick the Nord through and because you can drive the inputs, get a bit of distortion on there. It's got a nice valve distortion sound to it. Um, I never use it for recording vocals. I've never even tried it because uh, I think that the, the other things I've got sound better. Well, <laughs> I've never tried, so I don't know. It might be amazing. Could be missing out. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I use it ma mainly for synths. Um, the, the Nord's actually hardwired through that because I find that it really gives it a nice 
bite to the sound. Uh, underneath there is the just a boring old MIDI box, which I've had for years and years and years, ever since I first got Logic. I've been using the AMT8. Um, just a very reliable MIDI box. Now, next thing down, we've got the, you can see there's a range of these Mackie controllers here. And uh, I started off with this one. And this is like, well over 10 years old. I bought it when it first came out and it was actually, you can see if you can zoom in, it says E-Magic on the front, right? And where's the other one say Mackie? Now, the reason why it says E-Magic is because that's who originally owned um, Logic and before Apple came in and purchased Logic from them. And they made, uh, the E-Magic made in conjunction with Mackie, this controller. So they managed to get their name on there um, so it's, this is called the eMagic Logic Control. Now, if you buy it, it's called, uh, well, then what Mackie did, which was considered to be quite naughty at the time, they made their own version, which was exactly the same, uh, but they called it the Mackie Control. So this is where we've got the eMagic one here. Next to it is the Mackie Control Extender, okay? <laughs> Basically the same company that made them, but Mackie, Mackie took it off eMagic and started making their own one which was a bit naughty, I thought, but uh, they obviously knew what they were doing. So, but these are really good. It's basically, um, I don't use them as they should, but you've got this, you know, the transport control, stop, start, record, etc. cetera, um, zooming in and out. Um, you've got the, um, the automation read and write functions and latch, latch functions for logic there, um, mutes and solos and pans. If you want to, you can switch it into EQ mode and the EQ uh, will come up across the whole three surfaces there so you know you've got all the different bands of eq that show up and you can edit them with the controls at the top there um but i just tend to use it because i like for mixing i like actual physical faders rather than again using a mouse any way of getting it from, from uh, you know from using a mouse is, is good for me um you've got the con you've got the scroll wheel there which is really nice and because it's uh, originally made by logic it's it's a, again, it's a plug and play thing. You plug it in, you select it. Um, well, you don't even need to select it. it. Logic sees it, it comes up, and it's instantly mapped to it. So there's no, there's no room to mess around or no controller numbers or do any, because Logic's not great at uh, setting up controllers for it. It's not like Live where you, uh, Ableton Live, where you press a button, twizzle a knob, and then that, that knob's then assigned to that function, whatever. It's not like that in Logic at all although it is a little bit more like that in Logic 10, um, but the, this is why this is really great, because it's just instantly assigned. So next is, is, I think is like my prized possession, is the Thermionic Culture, again, the Fat Bustard. And uh, oh, I bought this, this is probably the most expensive piece of kit in here, and uh, it was a big decision whether I should buy this or not, uh, because I wasn't getting the results I, I wanted from my mix downs. This is basically uh, a little mini mixer and you can see you've got 12, well you've actually got 14 channels there. Um, so you can do stem mixing with it. So what you can do is rather than just mixing in the box in Logic, sending everything to stereo output and mixing there, you actually send it out from your sound card however many channels you've got, well, 14 in this instance, um, you split it up, send it to this. Um, and the idea is that with stem mixing, and it's the, the debate's out whether or not it's any better or not, is that uh, because you're into the analog domain, there's, there's more bandwidth. Um, so therefore you're not squashing the sound. Logic, when you've got all of these channels going into two streams like that, can't cope with it apparently. Um, so it's better in theory to send it out to 14 separate channels and then back into two channels. That's the theory. <laughs> um, but the only problem with that is I find that it's ba based on the quality of your sound card. And because I'm using for this, the old Motu 24 IO, I'm not sure that's the best sound for it. So I need to invest into a better sound card first. So I've got better um, DA and AD conversion going into it first. Um, because I think at the moment it's kind of the, the weakest link is the, is the sound card. But what I do use it for 
is sending my mixers or bits of mixers or you know specific sounds through it because it's got some great features it's got this attitude control here which is basically like uh, it's the, uh, the di a distortion from the thermionic culture vulture um, we've got then this basic basic really basic eq here it's a, ba it's a bass lift and a top lift coupled with a bass cut uh, all at different slopes and this gives you the, like the classic pull tech equalization so although it's simple it's actually really effective so for uh, you know to, to fatten something up let's, let's for instance show you the well, the drums from this track so come it's at 50 hertz so we can get that nice fat and then if you want if it's too much you can switch the bass cut on accordingly and that bass cut is a bit like uh, the, 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 the Pultec EQ where uh, if, you, if you know anything about the Pultec EQ you've got the, the bass emphasis and then the bass cut is the second knob after it and uh, it's just a way of scooping out the sort of mid-range frequencies around the emphasis frequency I, th I think it works so it's a bit like that so yeah that's really nice and then you can hear that the high has got a certain quality about it that you just don't get from any sort of no regular EQ and again it's got the cut there as well so you can take out if it's too much you can take some of that out coupled with the attitude control which is basically like a, a, a sort of a saturation so yeah that's that's with where are my drums yeah nice sort of fatness to the sound so I mainly use it for that I just use it for um, recording things through it and sending it back into the computer you know use a bit of the attitude control there that nice EQ and also the final mix downs as well is really nice to put through through that thing um, as I said I'm not splitting the outputs out at the moment because I need the better sound card but as soon as I can get invest into that then I'll start doing it that way so yes that's uh, price a bit of kit underneath that is another piece of kit that like I've had for years and that I probably never get rid of and people keep asking if they can buy it off me <laughs> but uh, I think you'll notice in this studio that uh, the stuff I've got is actually you know carefully thought about in terms of what I'm going to do with it and what I want and because I've been doing this for a long long time and I've, I've had so much gear that I've bought on a whim and then just thought oh I don't really like this and so I've had to consequently get rid of it I don't do that now I just whatever I buy it's carefully considered I make sure that it's something that it's going to be this is going to give me something different that's going to be and not only that but it will I'll be able to use it for years and years to come you know classic analog gear so this is a great example it's a Droma 1961 EQ it's, it's got uh, a valve stage for each band so it's one two three four five six seven valve stages for the whole EQ you can switch them in and out um, so your bass um, it's actually uh, quite a good sculpting EQ as well because you've got the control of the Q there you've also got you know the, all the different uh, sort of preset frequency bands there but that again was just uh, something that I bought because I wanted to warm up the, warm up the sound of of, of digital basically so often I'll, I'll send from the main output of the from the DAW into that and then back out again just so I can pass it through some valves and just warm up the sound a little bit purely for that I might not even add any EQ it's just just to go through the valve stages but it's also good to use on individual things like vocals it's got a sound that you just can't sort of replicate um, Droma is actually made in Rotherham, I do believe, which is not far away from here. <laughs> a friend of mine used to have a job putting knobs on those things. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and then we get down to the bottom. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but that's an old DAT digital audio tape recorder from the old days. Um, I've got a collection of DAT tapes, which I'm going to get out and listen to at some point, but they're, const they're, uh, they're currently um, drying out because they got a bit damp. So uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for them to to dry out and then I can have a listen. 
Okay, so now we're over to, uh, it's, I don't know, I think it's, it, I like to call this the analog side. Um, the only one thing that stands out is this, which isn't, <laughs> but uh, it's got some analog sounds in it. So yeah, um, we'll start at the top here. We've got the uh, Korg MS-20. This is actually an original one. It's not the, it's not the new version. Uh, I, I went to Alex Metric studio and he had one and uh, it was just such a pleasure to play with it. I bought the old, uh, when Korg released the, the software version, the legacy collection, uh, they, I bought that and it's actually, to be fair, it's not, a bad, it's not a bad job they did of it. It sounds really good. And what I did, the first thing I did when I bought this is I did a comparison between the legacy and the, uh, the original one. And you know what? There's not that much to it. I mean, they do sound different, I've got to say, but they did really get do a good job of, of, of emulating it. So, uh, and then there's a few extra features in the, the le legacy one, like synchronization for LFOs and uh, obviously in MIDI controllability and storing patches, etc., which makes it quite convenient to use. So, you know, you've got to be really into the sound of an MS-20 to, to, to want to own one of these, I think. <laughs> but, um, but saying that, when I went to Alex Metric Studio, uh, using it was just, there was just something about it that made me want the, the real thing. Cause I love the legacy one and I had, I've been using that for years. And then to use the real thing was just like, wow. Yeah. Okay. So legacy sounds great, but it's not quite the same. Uh, so to have a real one, but I spent, I, I, I got this and I spent 1400 quid on it. It came all the way from France cause it's a really nice model and they've done it. They, they've really sort of restored it quite well. And of course, what happens when I buy it? <laughs> Korg, only go and release the, the, the MS-20 Mini. Ah, damn it. Which was like 500 quid as opposed to 1400 quid. But anyway, <laughs> but I think they've, they've managed to keep their uh, the value up, apparently. So it's not all lost, but it's a beautiful thing. I use it on everything and it's just, you know, there's something charming about the MS-20 that's you know, you just don't get that sound from anything else. So next up, we got the, uh, the SH-101. Now this was, uh, a f belonged to a friend of mine in the eighties. We're going way back to like 1983 now. And, um, uh, we were at school and we used to be in a band together and his mum bought him this, um, or his parents bought him this. And I think when these came out, they were really cheap. They were like 299 pounds or something back in the 1983 when they first came out. I could be wrong on the exact date, but it was roughly that time. So this was new when he got it. And uh, mistakenly, he, uh, he lent it to me and then he went off to study being a doctor and I kept his SH-101 and uh, I've had it ever since. <laughs> Occasionally he'll call me and say, have, I, have you still got my SH-101? And I'll be like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but it's been there. So we've, I've literally had this uh, since about 1983, 1984. Um, first few life, first few years of its life, it was shared between me and its actual owner, but now it's mine. <laughs> but this, I just, uh, I, I learned to synthesis on this because it's, oh, I don't know, it's just so easy. Going back to what I was talking about, the Juno over there, it's basically like a monophonic version of the Juno, apart, apart from it hasn't got uh, um, uh, the chorus, um, but it's the same sort of architecture. You've got the one oscillator, uh, you can mix in a couple of uh, different waves there. You can mix in, a, it's got a sub oscillator and then it goes into the filter and then it's just got the one envelope. So it's the same similar synth architecture to the Juno 106. Um, so really easy. When I first started making synth sounds, this was just the perfect synthesizer to learn subtractive synthesis. Um, yeah, because it's so easy to make, make things. But then the, the range of sound you can get from it is great because you can modulate, you've got the modulator here. Um, you can modulate the, the filter or you can modulate the pitch of the uh, thing, but you've also got the, uh, you've got a random noise generator, which you can use as a modulation source for the VCF, for the filter, which can get, create some interesting sounds. So again, the range of sounds out such a simple thing is quite incredible really. And it's, so easy to use and it's so immediate to use that it's actually a real pleasure to play. You see, I'm having to play it from this keyboard because I'm using the bass station here as a MIDI. <laughs> this is a MIDI converter for that, so it's the keyboard's being disabled. So yeah, see what I mean? That's the, the noise. I'm using a noise source as a, as a modulation source for the filter. And as you increase, bring that in. 
and then you've got a random source modulation source for the filter like a sample and hold type thing and then you've got the square and the and that's on the filter there you can also uh, you can um, you can modulate the um, the oscillator and it's great if you use the the uh, noise source as a modulation source for the oscillator you know, it almost get some great snare drum sounds out of it if you listen to old recordings especially of like human league uh, their albums Travelogue and Reproduction, a lot of their um, drum sounds were all made using these old analog synths, but I, I mean, it, was, it was before the SH-101, so but that's how they got their drum stuff. Uh, so the SH-101, yeah, it's amazing for bass. Um, oh, let's take off this modulation. So immediate, and it's, uh, it's got a really fat bass sound purely because of this uh, sub oscillator here, which you can have one octave below, two octaves below, three octaves below. So it's you know this this fatness of. Uh, it's also got the the filters really nice because you can drive that into self oscillation, which is really good, um, and you get some. <laughs> And you, get, you get that classic Roland sort of sound that I was talking about that off the JPA 8080 there that they tried to replicate. You can almost use the, the filter as a pitch. Now, um, there's a company called TAL which have uh, just done a version of this and uh, they call it the TAL Baseline. It's one of their first plugins that they've uh, actually had for sale most of their stuff's been free and uh, so this TAL baseline is a is is a, an emulation of an SH-101 very close emulation they've not done anything um, they've not added any extra features of it and it is actually really really good I wouldn't say it's the same but again I did a comparison between this and the plug-in version and uh, oh, it was like so close <laughs> they've done a great job of that so if you guys can't afford the 750 and between 750 and a thousand pounds these go for now, it's ridiculous. Um, if you can't afford that, just go straight to the TAL baseline. That's because it's a great, great emulation of the the, the classic SH101 synth. I just love this thing. I always have loved it, and I always will love it. So that's why I've kept it. Right over here, we've got the uh, TR909. Everybody's seen the TR909. Um, I've had this for like 25 years or something. I got it, when I did get it, it was knackered. Somebody took it on the road and completely killed it, battered it, so I've just had it repaired and they've literally knocked all the dents out of it. Um, it's still a bit uh, dodgy, but it's there and it's beautiful. And uh, over here we've got the base station. I use this at the moment just for a MIDI converter for the SH-101, but this is a great thing, sounds amazing. Um, over here, we've got the Artoria Spark. Now, this I was a little skeptical about when I first saw this as a product um, but it really appealed to me because it's on the, the same sort of step sequencing idea as the TR909 uh, you program you program your patterns in by using these pads you can either add, you can either play them or you can um, you know just record in a sequence but again it's, it takes you away from the computer it's a bit like machine native instruments machine but I was skeptical about it um, but when I got it I was actually really chuffed because it's got a great sound library um, it's very easy to use again very nobular far more no <laughs> far more nobular than the than, than the machine so there's a lot of immediate immediacy to it um, I'm using words that I don't think even exist in the English language right now but <laughs> But yeah, this is, it's actually really good. And now they've just brought out um, Spark version 2 software, which, oh, sorry, I haven't looked at it yet. I just haven't had the chance, but uh, apparently that's supposed to be really cool. So I'm gonna get into that. That's probably my, my, my next job. The D50 and the Altoria Spark. <laughs> so there we go.